Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is going to explain why our little community of Mallory and Irvin enthusiasts needs to crowdfund the purchase of the drone footage taken on the 2019 National Geographic Expedition so that it can be released to the public. I will outline why it is overwhelmingly likely that Mallory and Irvin made the summit and why the drone footage would likely resolve where Irvin's final resting place is or provide enough information to know whether or not he is on the upper mountain. Before I begin, I will say that the description of the climb I use in this video was originally thought up by others. My main contribution is to use the photos I took while climbing the mountain and put together supporting facts into these YouTube videos. The route I use in my videos, which I refer to as the zigzag route, was first described by Edward Norton and later written about by Howard Somerville in his 1936 book, After Everest, as being the route Mallory and Irvin likely took. That they were likely seen at the third step was stated by both Andy Pollitt and Joachim Hemlip in the 1999 book Ghost of Everest. The idea that they were descending late at night when they fell has been mentioned by numerous authors ever since the goggles were found in Mallory's pocket. And the importance of searching for summer rocks was written about by Liesel Clark, a member of the 1999 expedition. Exactly why the rocks were not searched for remains a mystery. For the main points on the timeline I will use in this video, the start time in the morning, which step they were seen at at 12.50, and what time they made the summit, I use the exact same times used by Walk and Hemlip in Ghost of Everest. And while it would be too early to call this theory a consensus theory, it would be equally wrong to say it is a Michael Tracy theory. Numerous people have had these same ideas over the years, and I try to give credit to those who did the work, but occasionally someone gets overlooked. Since George Mallory's body was found 23 years ago, so much new information has come to light that it is now possible to construct a highly probable scenario for what happened on June 8, 1924. Although the failure of the 1999 team to search Mallory's pockets for summit rocks prevents us from knowing with certainty whether they made the summit, this video will compile all the new information into a detailed breakdown of the climb that leaves little doubt. And as compelling as this argument is, myself, and I'm sure most of you, would prefer some type of tangible proof that they made it, either a summit photo or summit rocks kept safe over the year in Andrew Irvin's zippered pockets. The only way that is going to happen is with a highly focused search, and to put this together, the drone footage taken from the 2019 National Geographic team would greatly help. At the end of this video, I'll talk a little bit about why I think getting it released is a realistic goal and what the next steps will be. For those new to the channel, I have over a dozen videos discussing the new information that has come out. This includes George Mallory's route description that shows he never intended to climb the second step. If you have not heard about this development, or you believe the main question is whether or not Mallory could have climbed the second step, I recommend that you stop the video here and watch the last step but one before continuing. I'll first go over some of the data analysis I performed about climbs and deaths on Mount Everest that shows people who die likely made the summit and people who turn around generally do not die. I'll then break down Mallory and Irvin's climb by time, and finally turn to the research relating to George Mallory's watch, performed by Pete Poston and Wim Kosicki. For the data analysis, I'll briefly discuss the high points and link to the full data set and all the analysis. However, in this video, I will be presenting the ideas in anecdotal form. That is, I will reference a couple key climbs that capture the essence of the information contained in the data and use those to tell the story rather than just using a bland description of facts and figures. If you would like all the facts and figures, simply click on the link in the description. In the past 98 years, there have been over 22,000 climbs of Mount Everest, over 10,000 summits, and over 300 deaths. This information was collected over the years by a woman named Elizabeth Hawley and put into a database that is publicly available. Ms. Hawley passed away in 2018 at the age of 94, but her organization still compiles the information and all the statistical data I present in this video comes from her database. Examining this data, a clear pattern emerges regarding deaths of people making summit bids. Overwhelmingly, the people who die are descending from the summit and people who turn around do not die. Over the years, the quality of climbers on Everest has deteriorated, and while there is no bright line when this change took place, I, the, I use the year 2000 as a dividing point, as in general, climbers before then were generally of a better quality than those climbing today. While the data does not change significantly, looking at dates in 2000 and prior is more likely to capture the class of climber Mallory and Irvin were in. Using this, for the 369 western climbers who made it past the second step, 15 died, all after making the summit and 56 turned around, all making it back safely. You can look through all the statistics in the link in the description, and they will simply confirm what is popularly known as summit fever. And as you go through the data, you will see that people who die generally made it to the summit, 
and people who turn around make it back alive. And while that is interesting, I'm going to outline how their climb happened, and if you like, you can go back to my 2017 video about the route to the summit and final resting place to see how much new information has come out since then. For this overview, I'm using the time recorded on George Mallory's watch of 1.27 a.m. as the time that they fell. I will then discuss where that time came from and why it is likely accurate. Recall from the plan video, Mallory intended to start early and proceed to his plan A route, which was to enter the couloir and climb out the small gully, unless there was wind, in which case he would take what I have termed the zigzag route, referring to Norton's description of the route as traversing back and forth between the strata until it is possible to break through. Mallory intended to be within the view of John Knoll sometime after 8 a.m., and this is the view Knoll had from his camera perch above Advanced Space Camp. Knoll had a clear view of the mountain until 10 a.m. when clouds blocked his view. Noel's view was primarily of the top of the zigzag route, and his camera was not trained on the small gully, although the exit would have been visible just to the right of his frame. However, Noel's camera had a telescope on top of it, and a photograph of the camera perch shows Sherpas using an additional telescope to scan the mountain. Thus, if Mallory and Urban had been climbing up the small gully prior to 10 a.m., they would have been spotted by John Noel, and he would just shift the camera slightly to the right to film their climb. Thus, at 10 a.m., we already know they are late, and there is no possibility they can make the climb to the summit prior to the afternoon. Mallory was well aware of the common weather pattern that winds pick up in the afternoon. It was his entire motivation for starting early. We shall be starting by moonlight if the morning is calm and should have the mountain climbed if we're lucky before the wind is dangerous. However, on June 8th, Mallory did not leave by moonlight as the moon would not rise until well into the daylight. He also left his compass at a lower camp, and while a compass is not normally needed to climb Everest, Mallory needed it to take an azimuth from high camp to the break in the yellow band he wished to climb. During daylight, the crack is obvious, and it is the route taken by all modern climbers. However, with no moon and no compass, it would not be easy to find prior to daylight, and he would have to climb well to the east of it and then traverse back until he reached the crack, which would just waste time. There is also the issue of the oxygen equipment Odell reported seeing in high camp, such that it appears there were some major modifications made to the system. As I describe in the bloody load, this is indicative that they decided to use an oxygen bottle caching system, which would entail leaving nearly the entire rig in high camp and just carrying the bottles and the valve attachment in a backpack. As for the oxygen bottle found in 1999, there are numerous issues surrounding it with different accounts of who initially picked it up, from where, and whether one bottle was recovered or two bottles. For this video, I rely on the accounts of Dave Hahn and Peter Persbrook, as their accounts come across as being honest and they seem to be straightforward people. And Persbrook was in a position to know whether a second bottle was recovered, and he reports that two bottles were recovered. As no photographs of the oxygen bottle on the mountain have been released, and the reported position of where the bottle was supposed to have been found keeps changing, I place little to no weight on the oxygen bottle. I just note that if any bottle was found below the first step, it would have been left there as part of a caching scheme, as it does not take four hours to climb to the first step with oxygen, the 1933 team doing it in three hours without oxygen. Given the lack of moonlight and a compass, and that John Knoll did not see them prior to 10 a.m., and the disarray of the oxygen apparatus parts in the high camp, it is reasonable to conclude that Mallory and Urban did not leave prior to sunrise, sunrise taking place at 5.13 a.m. As a practical matter, it is very difficult to leave high camp on Everest, and none of the early expeditions left exactly at sunrise. Just four days earlier, Norton and Somerville intended to leave at 5.40 a.m., but when the court came out of one of the thermoses, they had to take an additional hour melting snow. Thus, I will go with the departure time of 5.30, as this is reasonable, and it is also used by Hemlib in Ghost of Everest. For this mystery, there is no single piece of the puzzle that is essential other than the fact that they died. Each piece is supported and corroborated by other pieces. Thus, Odell's sighting at 12.50 gives us a very precise time, but if you wish to ignore Odell's sighting, you would still conclude they had switched to the zigzag route based on the lack of sighting by John Knoll prior to 10 a.m., that would place Mallory and Irvin behind schedule, and there would be no way they could reach the exit from the couloir prior to the afternoon when the winds would be a problem climbing on the north face. As Mallory was well aware of afternoon winds, as soon as he realized he was late, he would switch to the zigzag route so that climbing would be shielded from the winds. In 1999, Joachim Hemlib was in advanced space camp, and this page from Ghost of Everest shows Hemlib watches Anchor and Hod climb the third step with a telephoto lens, and Hemlib writes, it was a step-by-step -step instant replay of when Odell had reported his last view of Mallory and Irvin, and noting, now it seemed possible, perhaps even likely, that Odell had seen Mallory and Irvin at the third step, not the second. 
Since then, Hamlet seems to have changed his mind, but it's not clear why he no longer believes so strongly that it was the third step. I detail the issues with where Odell saw them in the last Step But One video, and as an update to that video, it should be noted Odell was not the only one to be confused about which step was which. This frame is from a documentary about Lincoln Hall, in which the steps are all shifted up one. That is, the third step is incorrectly labeled the second step. And this frame is from a National Geographic film about the 2001 search for Irvin, and the steps are all shifted down one, such that the second step is pointing to the first step. And this is a frame from a video by Bill Burke, who has been to Everest numerous times. It shows a climber on the third step, which is incorrectly captioned as the first step. Nor is the problem limited to videos. In Walt Unsworth's excellent book, Everest, The Mountaineering History, he includes this photograph with the caption, The Summit of Everest, seen from Advanced Space Camp during the 1986 Northeast Ridge Expedition. The second step is quite distinctive. And while it is true that the second step is quite distinctive, it is not pictured anywhere in that photo. The third step is barely visible, and the distinctive step along the ridge is the citadel, which I discuss in the last step but one, as being the one obstacle that Mallory spent the most time discussing, as neither Mallory nor Irvin ever mentioned the second step in any of the numerous letters, written plans, or diary entries. Thus, in the discussion about what Odell saw, entirely too much emphasis has been placed on whether he said the first step or the second step, given that modern researchers with editors and fact checkers routinely mix up the numbering of the steps along the ridge, it is not unreasonable that Odell did the same. Looking at what he described, there is only one place where climbers would be seen for an extended period of time crossing a snowfield, and if they were not crossing a snowfield, they would not be visible at a distance. Nor do you need Odell's sighting at all. With a departure time of 5.30 a.m. and a climb rate of 250 vertical feet per hour that I discuss in the bloody load, this places them at 28,450 feet, which is the base of the third step after climbing for seven hours, or 12.30 p.m. Thus, Odell's sighting places them just 20 minutes later than what would be arrived at by using simple math. Perhaps they left a little later, or perhaps they just climbed slightly slower at 245 vertical feet per hour. From computing the time from the third step to the summit, I'd outline the basics of the computation in the bloody load video using Tenzing and Hillary's climb time at that altitude as the absolute fastest they could make it. In researching this video, I came across the calculation from Walken Hamlin and Ghost of Everest that arrives independently at a substantially similar number. As such, I will simply adopt the time estimate of Walken Hamlin for the segment of the climb, and he puts them on the summit at 5.30. And using the watch at the time of the fall, they have eight hours left to live. The obvious question is, why do I think they went onto the summit rather than turn around at 4 p.m., which was Mallory's cutoff time? Simple, because they died. The photos of the mountain taken that evening show clear skies and little to no winds, but to see what went wrong, I'm going to look at other descents that had problems. The most useful is the Anchor and Han descent of 1999 because Han had run out of oxygen just below the summit. They cash Anchor's bottle at the bottom of the final summit pyramid and proceed to the summit which they reach both without oxygen at 2.50 p.m. They spend 10 minutes on the summit and descend, first picking up the bottle cash at the bottom of the final summit ridge, and then picking up a cash bottle at Mushroom Rock. Anchor does not report using any oxygen on the descent, and Han has very little until they reach the cash at Mushroom Rock. They start their descent off fairly rapidly, but as they descend, they get slower and slower until they get to their oxygen cash. From the summit to below the third step is about 600 vertical feet, and they do that in just one hour. From there to the top of the second step is about 200 vertical feet, and they also take one hour. At this point, Conrad Anchor calls for assistance so that climbers will come up and meet them with oxygen and hot water. This is a very wise call, even though they might have been able to make it back to high camp unassisted. From there to Mushroom Rock is about 150 vertical feet and takes one and a half hours. There were fixed ropes on the second step, and they repel down. The ladder used back then was fairly short and was not the larger one seen in modern photos. Thus, it was easier and faster to repel down. At Mushroom Rock, it was 6.30 p.m., and they are running out of daylight, but they pick up Han's cached oxygen bottle, which gives him a major boost. The next reported time is at approximately the 1933 high camp at 27,400 feet at 9 p.m. This gives 650 vertical feet descended in two and a half hours. They are met here by Tap Richards and Jake Norton with the hot water and oxygen. Anchor makes it back to high camp at 9.15 and Han at 9.35 p.m. Thus for Han, the descent took just over six and a half hours, while slightly less for Anchor. Both Mallory and Irvin would have started their descent late and would be slowed down first by sunset at 7.08 p.m. and later by moonset at 11.24 p.m. 
This situation is more similar to Dave Hahn's 1994 climb in which he and Guiliano de Marquet set out from high camp together. They were not really climbing partners, just heading up together. At the second step, de Marquet turns around and makes it back to high camp. Hahn presses on and summits at 4.45 p.m., but is not able to make it back to high camp that day. Hahn bivouacs just above the first step, and he is met the next day by a rescue climber who brings food, water, and oxygen. They descend together to high camp. And this is a good time to talk about the clothing differences between 1924 and 1994. Certainly, modern down suits are warmer. So much warmer that you can survive a night in the open as long as the weather holds or someone is coming to rescue you. In 1994, Mark Fetu survived two nights in the open, escorting his client, Michael Reinberger, down. Unfortunately, Reinberger ultimately perished on the descent. This story is told in the movie The Fatal Game, which portrays how much humans can endure and the emotional toll it takes on those who survive. Anyone who thinks Mallory and Urban just climbed to the second step, turned around, and died should watch that movie. Various studies of the clothing have determined that the clothing was adequate, although not capable of surviving a bivouac. Thus, modern clothing is better, so much better that you can spend a night or even two in the open as long as the weather doesn't get too bad. Mallory and Irvin did not have that option. They could not spend the night, and they did not have water and oxygen being brought, in, brought up to them the next day. And while the statistics show that overwhelmingly people die on the descent, what is missing from those statistics are the numerous people who were rescued while descending from the summit, people such as Dave Hahn, Lincoln Hall, and many more. Given it took Dave Hahn six and a half hours to get back to modern high camp in 1999 while descending mostly in daylight, the slightly shorter descent to the ice axe site done largely at night can be set to an absolute minimum time of seven hours and a maximum time of nine hours because after 2.30 a.m. they would have been dead under any reasonable set of conditions on the mountain. This is where the clothing makes a difference, while descending at night, not climbing during the day with good weather. The following is the account from Conrad Anker while he is climbing above the third step. We climbed the third step, an enjoyable scramble, much easier than the first or second. At the top of that, we were at the base of the summit pyramid, only some 500 feet below the top of the mountain. I was so warm I started to take off my down jacket, but all of a sudden a snow squall hit. It began snowing thick, heavy, wet flakes. Unfortunately, Anchor does not provide any temperature readings to compare with those recorded on June 8, 1924, but in general, June 8th is significantly warmer on Mount Everest than May 17th. Given a descent time of between 7 and 9 hours to get to the ice axe location, without looking at the watch, the time of their fall would be between 12.30 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. So now, let's look at the watch. Mallory's watch was a Borgel model that was popular with soldiers during World War I. An excellent analysis of the watch was done by Pete Poston and Wim Koseke, and I'd link to this research in the description. Although they did an excellent job in determining the exact, the exact time on the watch, it was later pointed out by Mark Sennett in the third poll that a photo of the watch with the hour hand on existed. Everest historians have been debating these markings ad nauseum, but I don't think most of them know that Tom took a photo of the watch before the hour hand fell off. I had seen the image, which showed clearly that the time was around 1.25, but a.m. or p.m., no one could know. It is not clear why a top-secret photo of the watch exists, nor what it would show if it were released. As I will get into at the end of the video, there is a significant problem because various photos and videos are not being released and conflicting accounts exist coming from people who have seen the material. I will not go through Poston and Kosike's analysis in detail, but the basic result is that the watch was not actually broken, but pressed into place such that the hands stopped moving at 127. Wim uses 127 rather than the 125 that Senate remembers seeing in the photo, and I will use the 127 time. That is, the watch was still wound and capable of functioning, and only stopped when it was crushed into place by the weight of Mallory's body. According to the article, once the obstruction was removed, the watch started ticking. The watch was not found on the first search of George Mallory on May 1st, 1999, as they did not check all his pockets. It was found on May 16th, and there are conflicting accounts about who found it and whether they were or were not using a metal detector. The crystal cover over the face of the watch was not on it, and the question is whether the crystal cover was on the watch when he put it in his pocket. Here, I call it a crystal cover, but the exact composition of the cover is not clear, as different models use different materials, and Mallory could have replaced the cover if it had become broken or scratched. One theory is that Mallory was wearing his watch on his wrist. This photo of Mallory shows him wearing a watch on his left wrist, facing inwards. It is not clear if this is the same watch, but it appears to be. At some point, the watch was hit. Typically, the so-called researchers believe this happened when Mallory stuck his arm into a crack in order to climb the second step. 
This theory ignores both that Mallory specifically said he would not climb the ridge route, and he specifically said he would not engage in any difficult climbing maneuvers. In addition, this theory requires that he hit the watch just hard enough to knock the crystal out, but not hard enough to break anything in the watch itself. Just a couple days prior to his summit attempt, Mallory fell down a crevasse and had to wedge his way out. Had the crystal been prone to falling out, it would have been at the bottom of the crevasse, and he would have removed the watch at that time. The other theory is that the watch was in his pocket the entire time because he was wearing at least six layers of clothing, as well as fingerless gloves and woolen over mittens. Checking the time from a watch on your wrist with all that clothing would be difficult, and it would be better kept in a pocket, which allows for fairly easy access with the added benefit that you get to warm your hands. Obviously, if the crystal cover was found in the pocket, the question would be resolved. Unfortunately, there are three different versions of how a watch was found and even who found it. In addition, the watch was not found the first time Mallory was dug up. With all the prying and using Mallory's legs as pry bars, the cover could have fallen out at any time, or it may have come off during the thousand foot fall from the ice axe location. The problem with believing the watch was on his wrist and that he only put it in his pocket when the crystal came off is that it's not clear how this would happen. That is, he wore the watch facing inwards, so we would have to try pretty hard to knock the crystal out. More problematic is that assuming that the watch was on his wrist and it broke, there's no explanation as to why he would put it in his pants pocket where the pressure from the pants would likely break the hands off. If the watch was broken and for some reason he felt it worth the time to protect it from further damage, he would have put it in an outer jacket pocket. The reason to keep it in the pants pocket was that it was not known how well the watch has performed in the cold. Equally problematic is that if, if it were placed in his pants pocket without the crystal, how did the hand survive the thousand foot fall? Mallory's body was battered, bruised, and he had a severely broken leg. It is unlikely that a watch in his pocket with no covering su suffered absolutely no damage. Instead, it is far more likely that the reason the face of the watch was not severely damaged in the fall was that the cover was in place for some, or if not the majority, of the fall, and it came off at some point during the fall. It may have fallen out of the pocket as Mallory slid down the mountain or during the uh, first search on May 1st, 1999. It would be helpful to know if the watch face was towards his body or not, but that detail was not recorded. The May 1st search was simply looking for a camera and was not concerned with thing like, things like rocks in the pockets or glass coverings. They didn't search the pants pockets because a camera could not fit in his pants pockets. They found an altimeter in a different pocket with the glass covering broken and yet did not recover any pieces of the broken altimeter cover because collecting small things was not part of their plan. This leaves the very real possibility that the watch points to the time of the fall and with a 1.27 a.m. time of death, it should be obvious they did not turn around at the second step. Putting it all together, the reasons to believe they made it. Number one, they died. This, more than any other item, is the best indication of what happened. And this is best expressed in an account by Mark Sennett in the third poll. He is describing his own team's descent after they made the summit. We had gone about 50 feet past Mushroom Rock when Matt's head bobbed like someone falling asleep at the wheel. He fell into the mountain against the rock on our right. Had he gone left, he'd have pulled us all off the narrow catwalk. Matt was the cameraman and, as is, is typical with modern climbers, had pushed to the summit when a better choice would have been to turn around. Fortunately for the group, he happened to fall to the right rather than the left, which would have pulled at least one other person off the mountain with him. Thus, an exhausted climber collapsed, and it was pure luck that he didn't pull the rest of the group down with him. At that point on the mountain, it would just depend how firmly the fixed ropes were attached. That late in the season, not a bet I would like to take. And as if it not could be any more obvious that this is what happened to Mallory and Irvin, Matt's last name is Irvin, though spelled with the I-N-G. As a note, a Sherpa gave Matt his oxygen, and they were able to get down the mountain. Number two reason would be that they used oxygen. Although there were numerous other pre-war attempts, none of them used oxygen for a summit attempt. For the few attempts with oxygen, a clear pattern emerges. In 1922, Finch and Bruce turned around when Bruce's oxygen apparatus broke down. In 1952, Tenzing Norgay and Ra Raymond Lambert turned back when their oxygen apparatuses stopped working. In 1953, Bordelon and Evans turned back when their oxygen apparatuses stopped working. And of course, later in that same expedition, Tenzing and Hillary reached the summit after Tenzing's apparatus stopped working, but they were able to clear the ice from the valves and get it working and make it to the summit. Thus, the key to making it to the summit is having oxygen and some ability to fix the problems that come up with the system, which is why Irvin was on the climb. The next big clue is the missing letter to his wife, Ruth. Although the story is told as him promising to leave a photo of his wife on the summit, that is only half correct. 
As I describe in the missing letter, the story is really that he promised to leave both a letter and a photo on the summit. When Mallory was found, he had letters to his brother, his sister, and a family friend, but not to his wife, Ruth. The statement in the book, the third poll, that he was carrying a letter from Ruth being fake news. The other items, such as the Odell sighting and the goggles in the pocket, are well known, but it is worth noting the extreme bias in the various accounts and the trend that people have initially indicating Mallory and Urban made the summit only to change their mind when they are given a book deal. So what can we do? The mountain is closed, and while it should be clear that the odds are extremely in their favor of them having made the summit, it would certainly be nice if summit rocks could be recovered from Urban's zippered pockets. Although Urban had a camera, the exact type is not known, but it was not a VPK because the developed film plates do not match the VPK, and there was no way Somerville would have given Mallory his camera, as discussed in It Is Known and The Plan. In 2019, a National Geographic expedition used a drone to photograph the upper mountain. Mark Sennett was on that expedition, and the drone was operated by Renan Ozturk after the code was specifically modified to allow it to fly beyond the standard range of off-the-shelf drones. Although National Geographic has not released the photos, in this still from a YouTube video of Tom Pollard, you can see he is using the drone photos. This one is zoomed out, and the next one is zoomed in on the area east of the warts. Curiously, Jake Norton was also there in 2019 and doing a search of the area east of the warts, but was apparently not shown these photos. It is not clear why Tom Pollard is allowed to use them in his YouTube videos, and more bizarre that they would not share them with a fellow group of climbers that were venturing into a risky section. The good news is, is that Tom Pollard can use them in his YouTube videos, so there is no clear reason why they can't be released to the public, and likely, it is just a matter of money. If you would be interested in a crowdfunding initiative, please comment below, and if we can get enough people that it looks like we could pay a reasonable amount, we can contact Tom Pollard and find out where he got the images from and how much money they want for them. If we want tangible proof, we have to do something. The mountain is currently closed, and this is our best option, but it will take a lot more people than just me. And who knows, maybe they will give us a two-for-one and throw in the May 1st search video.